Hi. Hi. We, uh, we've been talking with our mics off in the hall, in the green room, in the, and keep having moments where I say, we can't talk about this anymore. We have to wait and talk about this on stage. Um, I'm really, really happy you're here. I'm happy to be here. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge honor, and I'm a big life fan, and... Um, it's just great, and I'm really glad that you guys are all here, and this is such a beautiful space. I've, I've been here to hear people talk, but I've never been on this stage. Hey, Claudia. Um, <laughs> um, so, there's a balance of what we have to do, because um, tonight is an important night, maybe the last happy night for a while. Um, <laughs> Tonight is the last night of Obama's presidency. So we got to talk about this. And you had lunch with him last week. I and I have been really careful to not ask you anything about it. <laughs> because I, I know that you want to know. Don't you want to know? Start with the phone call. Take me all the way through. <laughs> I actually, um, well, I, I got an email, and to be honest, I thought it was about Michelle, which obviously I was incredibly excited about anyway. Um, I only found out late in the day that, that it was lunch uh, with Obama, and I only found out very, very late, you know, f uh, two days before, who else would be there. Um, it, it was, I don't know, I don't really know how to begin. It, it was an extraordinary event, uh, not so much for what was said, but just for the very idea that, he would want a bunch of um, writers, you know. Tell us who was there. Before he left. Um, it was me and Dave Eggers, Colson, Whitehead, Juno, Diaz, and Barbara Kingsolver. Yeah, it was a good crowd. <laughs> and did yeah. you, you knew all of those people? I knew all of those people. I, I suppose I, perhaps I've known Dave longest. Um, but uh, yeah, I know all those people. Oh, and Michiko Kakatani, who was horribly reviewed all of us at one point <laughs> made for an interesting lunch companion <laughs> um, but it, it was uh, he, he asked us for, he said I guess you're wondering why I asked you here I was thinking secret mission secret yeah. mission involving novelists Wait. that's uh, a real mafia yeah. line that's good <laughs> but in fact the answer was a lot uh, simpler it was just he said that um, you know when you're president there's lots of things you'd like to do but you never get to do them but in the last few days, he thought he'd just do what he liked. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was joking with us a little bit. It went on to more serious uh, point of view. I mean, the exciting thing, for, I think, for books people, which I believe was uh, reported in the paper, is that he wants to use some of his uh, platform to encourage reading and to um, put people before books and to create a literary discussion in America more widely. The funniest bit for me, I'm going to go on about very long, but it was when we were talking about... No, actually, we would like you to go on <laughs> I the entire him. hour about this. We were talking about serious things, and then I thought it got a bit serious, so I asked him if he ever thought about writing a novel. It's just a frivolous question. And then he said, oh, well, I, you know, I, I think I'm a quite good writer, but I don't think I'm very good at plot. And I said, well, neither am I, but you can work around it. <laughs> got a laugh from, for that. And then he started talking about his short stories, and he became quite... Um, contemplative about these short stories and whether they were very good or... And I could see Dave was looking at me like, I mean, dude, you're the president. Who cares if your short stories are good or not? <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's fine. <laughs> but, but um, you know, it's an extraordinary thing to meet someone in such a position of power who is still recognizably a human being. That's not such a common uh, state of affairs, I think. Yeah, but how many people have you met in such a position of power? Uh, well, I, you know... <laughs> As I've met a few, actually, well, you know, as the time has gone by, and um, he was the only person I've ever met like that who's, who's, when people ask me what it was like to meet him, I would say it's exactly as you'd expect because there is no gap between the person you see on TV and the, and the man. There's a kind of um, a congruence which is unusual, I think. 
Um, so there was nothing surprising in a sense about meeting him because it was just that guy that, that you think you know. It was the same person. Yeah. What are you going to do if that's the case with the next president? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the thing, though? You think, well, there's got to be a gap, right? Like the guy that you're seeing couldn't possibly be the guy that he really is. If I'm offending anyone, I don't even care at this point. Um, 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 I mean, I, I, I think it's a matter for his shrink if he has one, but I don't think, I think he's a man who is a, a stranger to, to himself. It's a different thing. I think anyone with small children recognizes him very strongly that there's a, I have a three-year-old and a lot of the Donald's <laughs> tendencies remind me of my, Three-year-old, you know, bare-faced denial of obvious fact. <laughs> I did not break the glass. It's broken in my hand right here. Um, anger in the face of humiliation is very common. Like a three-year-old will scream if you laugh at something that the child has said, um, inadvertently funny thing. Like my child said recently, um, he was bending over to have his bottom wiped, and I, he, he turned around and said, "Look, I can't do downward dog all day." He's a New York child. <laughs> So I laughed, and then he was filled with fury, because children are so immediately humiliated by being laughed at, you know. But adults usually have a thicker skin for these things, but, but um, our president doesn't, our new president. Doesn't. Tomorrow, not our president. Uh, tomorrow. <laughs> um, yeah, but at the same time, you know, I, don't, I, I do think it it's not, doesn't really behoove artists to be so... Um, enamored of a president. So in a way, those writers sitting around a table, I think we all felt a bit sh sheepish. You know, it's not, it's, um, power is a separate thing. He seems like a writer, Obama. He has a writer's mentality, and, but he's not a writer. It's important to tell the difference. He's a man who makes decisions that none of the people around that table would ever dare make, for example. He's a man who is pragmatic, who is um, astute, politically astute, who uh, chooses for the greater good when he can. Um, but he can't always. All those things which are compromising to a person he has to do. I, I don't judge him for it because I would never, I could never imagine myself in such a role. Um, I don't judge him as a human person, but you have to judge him as a political citizen, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, that, that was the interesting thing, being around a table with someone who, as a person, is, is honestly as admirable a person as I've ever met in my life, and at the same time is embedded in a system which, by its very nature, um, is, a, is always oppressive to someone somewhere. You say that it isn't a good thing for writers to be enamored of the president, and I, I really get that. And I wonder, in a way, if it will be, in any sense, beneficial to art to be in opposition. It, it will be wholly beneficial, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be a good time. No, like, I, no I get it. With, with Margaret Thatcher, it was an incredible time for music, for writing, and that doesn't mean that any of us enjoyed it. It, was, it just was, it's a, it's a side effect. Um, perhaps nice in retrospect, but usually painful um, during the period. I keep thinking about forest fires. You know, and I used to live out in Montana and, you know, 100,000 acres would burn and you would just think this is such an incredible loss and then somebody would come and say, but the underbrush has to be cleared out and the seeds can only germinate at this incredible heat. And so you think, well, you know, is this going to be the thing that will wake us up and make us germinate? I think, I mean, I went to see Ta-Nehisi Coates speak about three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Um, with Lena Dunham, actually, a fascinating <laughs> pairing. And, uh, Do you know why it was a fascinating pairing? Um, I know Michael organized it, right? Shabon, yeah. Because he asked me. Oh, did he? And, uh, and I was like, I think a lot of people get were Lena asked, Dunham. Yeah, I and said. Every, everybody was a, a little afraid of Tana. He's because he's, you know, he's a, a strong personality. But he was on stage, and he said, um, you know, he had a smile on his face. He said, "I can't wait for this. I'm excited. I'm ready for it. I want to have a war. I love having a war." And so for people like that, um, with that kind of really uh, aggressive journalistic mentality, I think it is an extraordinary opportunity and a time to really focus what it is that you believe and fight for it um, in, in almost a, a, a black and white way. You know, you, you can see exactly what is needed and you can pursue it. Um, so it, it can be an exciting time. Uh, for artists of more um, inward facing, mentality like myself. It's more complicated, I think, um, but still in incredibly interesting. 
I, I feel like it's almost an out-of-body experience at the moment, um, but, but it's interesting. Well, we don't know what's coming. Right. So you are back and forth between the US and London. What, what's your schedule? No, I'm pretty American now. My children are here and in school here, so I go back for the summer, you know, for like July, August, or a bit of June, July, August. Um, but our lives are here, and, and um, my news brain is focused here, you know. Okay. I, I can't keep up with two apocalypses at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that so was I've, really my question. I've chosen to focus on, Brexit on Trump. this one. Okay. <laughs> this is the one I'm focusing on. Um, uh, the other one, uh, yeah, I don't know what to say about the other one. But um, no, I'm focused on this one, and uh, e even, you know, everything I've said or felt about Obama to this point suggests to me that I've become American or he's a, a, a truly unique person because my relation in England to leaders or to any European to their leader is not the relation you have with Obama. Like nobody ever wept while David Cameron was giving a speech. <laughs> no one ever wept. When Thatcher was giving a speech, you don't have that relation to them. They are your, a civil servant working for you for very lowly money in fact. Like, until very recently, the Prime Minister was paid something like £120,000. I mean, there were executives everywhere all over London making more money than that. So they, they work for you in a kind of uh, almost servile capacity, really. But when I moved to America and first saw those enormous rallies for politicians, like most English people, I found it completely absurd at first. I couldn't believe that people came and waved flags and cheered and, and spoke about these candidates as if they were personal friends or, or that they needed to like them in some intimate right. way. That's all very um, alien to British political culture. Um, you don't have to have a beer with Theresa no, May? No, I don't have to have a beer with Theresa May. I mean, I wouldn't want to anyway, but I don't have to have one. <laughs> but I did watch Obama's speech in tears, like a lot of people, and, I, and that's where I wondered whether it was something unique to him or whether I had become... American in the sense that I looked at my president not just as a civil servant, but as a moral guide, as a kind of uh, figurehead, as an actual leader in the real sense. I think that must have happened, really. Otherwise, I can't account for. Would you have watched him. that speech in tears? And I, I, I mean, I sobbed through the whole thing. Um, if if Clinton had won. Because I didn't know how much of it was I was moved by what he was saying or I was thinking, this is what we're losing. I, I was not a huge Hillary fan, but I think that this political structure of America, the fact that one person is speaking for, to, and about millions of people, a, a, scale, a country on a scale that is impossible for a small European nation to really conceive of, is in itself inherently moving. I, th I think that's really what it is. It's the scale of the operation, unprecedented in modern history. That's, that's what I think bowls me over. And particularly in Obama's speech, uh, the middle of it, the, the call to citizenship, in which I uh, felt personally I implicated, you know, what do I do? I have a green card and I write my books, that's about it. Um, I, I don't know how many of you felt implicated by that, but I did, I did feel that. At least you vote. I don't even vote. So I, I felt this, um, the point that he was making that this, if you want something to change, this kind of armchair intellectualism right. is not good enough. Get a clipboard and right. some signatures. Right, go out there, yeah. do something, yeah. yeah. To what extent do you think this is a political novel? Um, to me, uh, to me it was very political, but, but it was from the start a book about blackness in my mind in a kind of existential sense. Like, what, what does it mean to think of oneself as black, to exist in blackness? That, that's what interested me. Um, and I thought about different responses to it. Um, obviously, the mother in the book is a act, an activist. She's literally an activist. Um, and I think anybody who has been around activists, it's an interesting double bind of a life because you're doing good for the people. But the people, in the end, are an a, a kind of abstract quantity, and quite often the people closest to you are not your focus, they can't be because you have this mm -hmm. larger project. Um, that interested me a lot. I didn't come from a family like that, but I uh, had new people, especially when I got to college, who had been the children of these outward-facing people, you know, activists, writers, uh, important people of one kind or another. 
And I guess when I was a kid, I had always aspired, I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to be in that kind of world with a family like that? And when I met the children of those families, I realized that maybe it wasn't the happiest thing in the world. So it's partly that knowledge. Um, and then just thinking in a more intimate way of my own mother and the way that uh, the blackness as she felt it and defined it in England was a kind of survivalist program, right? She was trying to protect me and my brothers from something all the time. That's how she felt. She had to protect from other people's opinions, views, stereotypes, from simple bodily danger in the case of my brothers. There's this kind of emergency that you're living in all the time. And my interest was, how does, how does that deform you in more intimate ways, you know? Because nobody should have to live like that, crouched to protect their people all the time, with that consciousness in their mind all the time. What everybody wants is to live freely. Freely, not just physically, but mentally. Um, but to, to be uh, black is not to be free mentally, not entirely, I don't think. Because it's to have this double consciousness, you are you, and then you are what people think you are. And that starts very young, that kind of double construction. And I never, I hadn't really read a book that thought about that from the inside, like there are, of course, incredible examples. Jimmy Baldwin, for example, gets closest to me to that kind of double consciousness, but I wanted to try and write a novel about that, yeah. And then when your narrator goes to West Africa and everything is flipped on her again. Right. Um, have you spent a lot of time there? That, those, those Africa scenes were amazing. I, I did, it's, been a, it's kind of been a long process over the past 10 years. I, uh, my first visits, I think, were to Liberia for work, journalism, basically. And then my mother fell in love with a very young Ghanaian man and married him for a while. My mother quite frequently meets people and falls in love with them and then forms new lives. So for a while, we had a, a Ghanaian life. Um, so that was my first experience. Because Liberia was obviously a kind of extremity. I was going in a, in a, with a charity for journalism, so I saw one version. Um, of a certain kind of West African life. Ghana was city life, you know, it was a completely different uh, existence. And then I started going to the Gambia out of kind of curiosity. Um, so uh, it's all those experiences, I guess, that have fed into it, yeah. Why write something that people are going to pick apart as autobiographical? And, and, I, and I'm asking yes. you that. It's a good you know, it's, and, um, <laughs> Sadie and I are both on the shortlist for the uh, National Book Critics Circle yeah. Award, Go Us. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's really interesting. I was thinking about those books. Michael's, Michael's book, is the same, yeah. uh, Moon Glow, very much the same. Adam yeah. Hazlitt's book, Imagine Me Gone, very much the same. Louise's book, Louise Erdrich's book, La Rose, not so much. Yeah. Although the autobiographical stuff, you know, is sort of culturally autobiographical for her. But in those, your book, my book, Michael's book, Adam's book, it's a very similar set right. of problems where people are going to be saying, is that your mother? Right. Is that uh, the, young, the young African lover? Was that your mother's younger lover? Right. Was it? Why? Well, that for me was the risk. I, I think the reason it's happening at this moment um, is to do uh, with a certain kind of reality effect. There's been a lot of arguments, literary arguments over the past decade about the death of fiction and what was happening with fiction. And, and two writers, I mean, every, I'm sure a lot of people in this audience already know them, but the Norwegian Nauskard and Ferrante did this uh, thing which looked like a uh, confession, but is actually the use, the, rem the remembered use of a really ancient literary effect, which is first person confession. Everything in those books is phony, but it has this uh, feeling of truth, and there was, a, I think, a sense amongst readers that they they hungered for reality for whatever reason, because the the reality they see on the TV seems to them false, because their own lives sometimes seem to them artificial, because their whole lives are going through these um, uh, phones, so that there's a kind of medium between you and the world. There's this great hunger for reality, and I think literature has responded with this. Uh, thing that looks like reality, but is a reality effect. It's incredibly strong, and I'd never used it before. I always wrote in the third person. I was always concerned with, the, you know, the largest possible cast of characters. It never, it really never occurred to me to write in the first person. I just, I hated exactly that, that kind of autobiographical 
error that people make or mistake or made me feel sick, even the thought of it. Um, and writers I grew up with, I'm sure you grew up with people like Roth, um, not like writers I admire, but I found that kind of autobiographical fiction just way too, I just, I don't know, too much for me. But once I started writing in the first person, it was just really thrilling. Part of it was the risk, exactly, of knowing that how boring and annoyed I would be by the questions that would come from Yeah, the right. Book. It's like you're risking something, but it's also like a, a, a performance. It, it is completely personal, but it's more like saying, uh, what if I was me, but almost everything was different and nothing had happened in the same way? That's the question. So it's more like being an actor saying, what if I put on a different life? And in that way, it's very voyeuristic. Like, I get to do things in this book that I never did, that never happened. I get to have, you know, a completely different family, no siblings. Um, I get to be my mother and me. I get to be an international pop star, also her assistant. I get to be right. all these people. I get to never have been taken from my people in West Africa. I get to be in West Africa as if I was never removed from there, as if the whole of slavery hadn't happened and I lived there the whole time. So it, it's a series of... It, I, it's a lie to say it's not autobiographical, but I guess just not in the way that people think. It's a different process. You said something on Fresh Air that was so interesting about this, about how Terry Gross said, is the mother your mother? And you were like, no, the mother's kind of me, or the me I'm afraid of being right. with my children. And I do think that in fiction, it, it's incredibly autobiographical, but it is the lives that we didn't choose, right. the things that we didn't do. I think, I think that's what the reader doesn't get. Obviously, he doesn't get it, because you you, you're trying to disguise it and make it seem as real as possible. But it, it's that, and there are different versions of it. I think my particular pathology is like casting into the future. So if I, like with On Beauty, I'd just been married, but I thought, well, how about if I was married 30 years? What would that look like? Right. And I wrote a novel imagining what it would have been like to be married for 30 years and to be American and to be in a different... You know, it's a series of what-ifs that kind of I find curious. And then sometimes there are other projects which are... Like we were just talking in the hall, I've got a historical novel in mind. And that's a completely different exercise. That's like when your brain is hung hungry to rearrange uh, elements. You know, you're given a load of elements facts, settings, people, and you just want to like, create a puzzle out of it. It's a different kind of organizing principle, I think, than, than this acting thing where you think, what if, what if I was her? I do think it's strange that we all came to it at the same time. I mean, it does make me wonder culturally what's going on. I think it's culture. I think it's midlife as well. It's midlife. Broadly expressed, right? That you... Midlife is the point in which you think... I've passed midlife, <laughs> actually. <laughs> what if Unless I'm going to be really, what? really old when I die. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the middle anymore. <laughs> what, what about the other road, right? I saw that in Michael's book very clearly. It's a kind of... He's thinking about how he got to where he is. He's, he's thinking about all the roads that led there. And the absolute contingency of it, right? Like The thing about Michael's book is that everything that happened in it, he, he is fictionalized to the nth degree and it's all uh, like almost bellowized, right? It's all so bright and colorful and over the top. But it also gets to the core of the fact that everything that led to Michael and his life is utterly contingent. It could have gone any other way. It could easily not have existed or not existed in this form. I think that's a very compelling idea for novelists. And it is inherently um, political because it disengages you from this very narrow idea of your personhood. Like the, the most obvious example I can always, uh, I always bring to mind is, say you consider yourself an American and you want to make America great again. You feel like America is yours and it's in your blood and you are an American all the way down. When I think about that and I think of my son who is an American, as American as you are, he has a blue passport, he sometimes wears a red baseball cap, often backwards, he's three. <laughs> And he will grow up, and I imagine, because he'll go to American schools, he will learn about the American Civil War, and he'll learn about Lincoln, and he will consider this his history, right, in a fundamental way. If you ask him, a Frenchman says to Harvey, what are you? He says, I'm an American. I'm proud to be an American. Now, I know he's an American because I couldn't be bothered at that moment. I was seven and a half months pregnant to go back to London, so I just stayed. Could easily have gone back. He could have been born in London. I was in the middle of... He could have been born in France. It's a completely accidental, contingent thing. I am British. His father's Irish just because I decided to switch countries at the last minute, 
here we were in New York and he was born here. That history, he comes with that accident and he will fully feel it, right? And his children will feel it even more strongly. They might even go to war for it and like kill a man in the street because of it. But it's based on an absurdity. Doesn't mean that it's not meaningful, by the way. That's where I feel differences. It's just that if you allow for its absurdity, you can find a little more movement in it. You find yourself a little more ridiculous standing on a street corner with a flag and a hat saying, America! <laughs> sure, cool. But everyone is born somewhere. It's, it's just a thing that happens. <laughs> it's not a big deal. However, if you love the history and you're interested in it and you're curious about it, then to say you're an American becomes a meaningful thing, you know? Obama's, for instance, Obama's engagement with his country, though as many people seem to feel his birth is tenuous or whatever, mm. but his engagement with America is, he chose to be that engaged with it, to read all those ponderous historical biographies and learn every last word that Lincoln ever said. And he, he has a love for it, but it doesn't run in your blood. It's not a genetic gift. It's just a choice. Were these things that you think you would have thought of if you'd spent your whole life in England, or do you think that this is a particularly American situation? I, th I think that maybe uh, uh, being biracial is, um, lends an extra uh, frisson of contingency to your life. I'm no, my birth is no more interesting or different than anybody else's in the room, but it, just, it does happen if you were born half black, half white in the 70s. It was very radiantly clear to you that everything was an accident. Like my mother coming from some tiny little village in Jamaica and my father 30 years older from a completely different part of England, accidentally meeting one night. I mean, it's so, to me, my whole existence seemed to be uh, highly unlikely. And, and if you proceed from that point, I just feel that you don't proceed with this sense of your own certainty and rights. Rights are a very complex uh, idea for me. I understand duties, like I owe you something because you are my mother and my father. I owe this school, I owe my country, maybe. But the rights that accrue to you, I, f I find much more complicated. I think you can fight for them and ask for them and demand, but they don't just magically like appear from the sky. What about talent? A talent and, and talent, and, and I should say, a lot of the book hinges, especially at the beginning, on talent. There are two girls, they are great friends. One is talented for dance and one is not. They both wish to be talented. <laughs> I think talent is the very extreme edge of our meritocratic argument. It's quite hard to deal with talent. It's um, like undemocratic, highly unfair, annoying, usually. Um, I, but, but I do think, I, I, I mean, for myself, when I was a kid, I, I, um, I did like to sing and I liked to think and write. And, uh, the thing I always disliked about singing um, was the fact that you just opened your mouth and a nice sound came out, and it didn't seem to me that that was very that that meant anything. That that's kind of talent to me in the most um, accidental form. And I think that a, a singer is somebody who uh, is more than someone with a pretty voice, right? We know that from watching those TV shows where people sing nicely, but that doesn't make them artists of any kind or, or real singers. A singer is Leonard Cohen, a singer is Joni Mitchell, a singer is Stevie Wonder. These are singers. The fact that you can sing uh, you know, a nice Mariah Carey song and to put all the trills in is a different matter. So for me, it, talent is fine, but what makes artistry is, is much more to do with work and commitment. Um, and when it came to writing, it seemed to me clear that talent is uh, fine, talent's okay when it comes to writing, but it's, it's about so many other things. Self-control, a certain kind of will, patience, and a lot of work. The, the talent part, some, the weird thing is some of the most talented writers are, are the worst writers. Talent can be a kind of a liability sometimes. Every sentence is perfect, it all rolls off, everything's wonderful. Um, that, that to me is not what makes a good writer. So I guess in writing I see a place where talent is more, it, it doesn't just rule the roost. There's a possibility of improving, which I find really great about writing. You can get better by working and concentrating on it. Um, with singing it was very obvious to me that there was Aretha Franklin and there was me, and the gap was never <laughs> gonna be breached. Um, so 
writing has the possibility of movement in some way, of discovering some new way to do it that works. So you teach? Yeah. So what happens when you have a student who isn't talented, or a student who's very talented? I would more narrowly define it. Like, I think, like all of you, when you're sending emails, you must have those people who send you an email, and you just don't read it, because it's just, it's just, even, it's long, it doesn't, it's, it's not compelling in some fundamental way, it's just <laughs> words. And then there are other people who, no matter what they're emailing about, they're always interesting. Like, it could be anything, some boring administrative thing, but they have the, the talent of being interesting, I heard it described once by James Wood, and that is a rare thing. Um, and I, I see that a lot of the time, but it doesn't always lead to something, you know? Um, the secondary thing, that kind of control and willingness to be alone, that's, that's the main thing I'm always trying to yes. press on my students, that one of the things writers are people with a huge capacity for loneliness. Like, they really dig it, and the longer they're alone, the happier they are. Like, if you're ever late for lunch with a writer, don't think that they're sad. <laughs> they're never sad. It's like, ooh, another 15 minutes to read my book. They love it. The later you are, the happier they are. There's one exception, Jeff Dyer, who gets incredibly angry about these things. But everybody else, uh, lateness is good. They want to be by themselves. So I, I suppose when I'm teaching, I'm saying to them, it, it's, the most important thing is, do you, do you have... <laughs> the personality for it. I really do think that's a major part of the deal. I agree. I, I think all the time I meet people who are a lot smarter than I am and a lot more talented than I am, but what I have is the ability to right. stay on point for years. Years. It has to be alone. years. With no performance no, review, with no. no input, with nobody checking yeah. in to say, no good job saying, right. on that page. It's just you Nothing. and the page for seven Nothing. years. Yeah. yeah. That. And so that capacity, I think, is, is rarer. And a lot of the, the people in my class, some of the most talented, they went on to be literary journalists. They were great editors. Um, but, but they didn't want to be alone for seven years. And I don't blame them. It's not, most people don't and wouldn't want to. And why would you? It's a weird thing to do. But, um, and that's not a skill I'm sure you could learn. Most, I think most of the skills you can learn. There, there are people, most people I think their writing could be improved and lifted. There are some people who are, you can't help them. <laughs> that's definitely the case. And the funny thing about those people is quite often in my class they are the smartest people in the class. Like, it's often a boy and he's like a genius, like he reads nothing but Foster Wallace and Kick guys, like they're geniuses. They love Delilah there, and everything seems on paper like this is going to be great, and they cannot write a word. It's just a hopeless thing from the beginning. And that, I never understood that when I first started teaching, I always, because I have a sympathy for intelligence, and I'm on the side of intelligence, so I'd always think, oh, this brilliant young man must be the best writer in the class. And most of the time, it took me about 10 years to work out this out, it was the entirely silent girl who I hadn't even looked at for 10 weeks, who at the end of the course had something, and I was like, oh my god, it was her. Ain't I was it, always yeah. focused in the wrong direction. So it's taken a long time to realize that uh, traditional academic smarts and writing, they do occasionally go together. And the cases that those boys love, like Foster Wallace, like Dillo, are good examples. But when you think about it, that is not really what literature has been dominated by. It's really dominated by a kind of idiot savant who is very, very good at one thing and idiotic at everything else. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Can't fix a thing, can't drive a car, can't add, can't. It's, the list is so long. Yeah. The things that they can't do. Yeah. And that person is usually closer to the novels. That's the other thing I sometimes say to these boys is don't feel bad. This is an idiot's game. Like, don't. It, it's not about being the most brilliant person in the room. It's okay to be an idiot in this field. Because what you really need more than anything is, is the emotion. You can have the smarts and the emotion. That's number one, that's great. And you can have the emotion without the smarts, but smarts alone is not going to do anything. That's just not a novelist. It's something else. Something great, maybe, but not a novelist. So you've got a big career as a writer, and you're married, and you've got two little kids, and you've got a family, and you've got two countries, and you teach. Mm. Yeah, I feel a bit stressed at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your, yeah. your head just went back yeah. a little. How, uh, how's that working for you, Zadie? Um... It's okay. I, like I, I'm sure, like you, like the, I've, the amount of places where I can concentrate have expanded. Like as long as I have the Bose headphones and brown, <laughs> I, I can work in an airport. I can work 
on, in a car, even though I feel sick. I can work in lots of little corners of time. Um, I, I think we were talking uh, outside about giving up the internet pretty much, or at least giving up having it in any way on my person has been the only way it's been possible to continue being a writer and, and doing the rest of it. So that, that was the choice. And I haven't regretted it, really. But I just can't imagine any other. I can't imagine doing it with the internet as well. Do you ever think to not teach and live in the wilderness, that sort of thing? I, I do. You do. Have, do you have the my, chuck it all and go to Vermont fantasy? My husband thinks of it all the time. He is a country boy. And, and I think it will happen soon. I don't quite want to give it up. Because of the aforementioned no internet, the young people are all that I have <laughs> to keep me in any way connected to what the hell's going on. So uh, I don't mean to sound like a vampire, but I do. I need my students. Like I'm about to start teaching them in a week, and I'm so curious because I haven't seen them since all of this happened. Uh, so being around them is use. It's just really useful to me. It has been. I used to complain about it, and then I realised it was essential. The kind of conversation we have every week. That that's my intellectual life, you know. Apart from me and books and me and Nick. That's, that's it. And I do, ne I do need that. Oh, that's a, beautiful. Yeah. I'm glad. So that I like, but, but I can imagine it's, the time is coming where I, I can imagine stopping. Yeah. Okay, to take a turn, I have a really great idea yeah. for a title for your book. Yeah. Swing Time? It's a good title. It's not bad. But I... <laughs> I have the perfect title for the book, and this is what yeah, tell me. this is what I really wanted to talk to you about the whole time I was reading the book. You should have told me like six yeah. Years well, ago. you will see. This actually yeah, isn't going to be yeah. helpful at all. The Handmaid's Tale. Oh, <laughs> that is a perfect title. She already took that one though. I couldn't. I want to talk about the condition of being a handmaid right. because when I read this book, I identified so strongly right. as a handmaid. Yeah. Um, the, it, this is the story, and, the, and the, the story goes back and forth between the two little girls who then grow up and are friends and then not so much friends, right. and then the narrator becomes the servant of this very famous pop star. Right. And it is the little girl, Tracy, who is a very talented prima donna who trains our narrator to be later the handmaiden right. to the pop star. Talk about handmaidendom. You know, I didn't, when I was writing it, I wasn't conscious of it. It was when I finished that I really saw the patterns in it. It, it was quite a subconsciously written book. And even that by itself was different for me because I'm, I'm normally trying to be so in control of everything, you know. So partly allowing myself just to write and, um, and not ask myself too many questions as I was going along about why this was my subject. By the time I finished, I could see the patterns. And part of it runs very deep in my family. Like my father's mother, my white grandmother, was a servant in a kind of uh, big country house like you see on Downton Abbey. She was the chambermaid. And my mother's mother was uh, orderly in a hospital, so, you know, taking away people's trays and all that stuff. So, uh, and then I guess, guess going back in their clans, there's nothing but more of, of that. Um, and so that was in my mind. And of course, there's a great leap from that history to where my life is now. So, but it's, it's always in my mind, I guess, in my consciousness, um, that that is the history of the women in my family. And then I guess also, uh, it's certainly about the idea of living around big personalities. My mother is a very big personality, for sure. And I think if you, if you grow up with a mother like that, you, it's, you are somewhat in shadow all the time. I mean, you can't help but be, because the person you're living with is so bright. My mother in real life is a different kind of um, big personality than, than the woman here. The woman here is very severe, very academic in her way. My mother is more like the life and soul, you know, this kind mm -hmm. of mother. <laughs> of every party, of every you situation. You met my mother yeah. today. Yeah. Yeah. She's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's that kind of mother. So it, it interests me being the child of that kind of mother. Like my husband is a child of the other kind of mother who is, um, you know, mum who does everything for you. Before you've even thought you were hungry, the plate is there. And, you know, that kind of mother. The mother you see on TV. And my mother um, 
if I was eating food, is more likely to take the food off my plate to feed herself because she's hungry. <laughs> um, so I, I, kind, I guess as I've got older, I really admire the, the chutzpah of it, you know, like just instead of kind of submitting and say, I am a mother and I submit myself to my job, your, your child. My mother was more like, no, I'm me and I will continue to be me and yeah. I also have these children. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but, I, but it's that kind of um, relation. There's a lot of big women in my family, my mother, my grandmother, all of my aunts. Um, so I, I was aware of being a quieter child or at least more inward and, and just less social, certainly than they were, They're very, very social talking to everyone, everywhere we went, every time you left the house, everybody on the bus, every... And I always found that pretty excruciating as a child, I guess. So I just wanted to be left alone, and they're always giving it that. Um, so that was partly it. Um, also, I think when you write, don't you feel a bit like a handmaid? Not when you're doing this, like, oh, now you're on stage and it's all fancy and... Like you're the Isn't this fancy? Yeah, it's very fancy. <laughs> you're, the, you're the focus. But when you're writing, I, I have felt more and more that, and meeting other writers, that you're under a weird kind of yoke. Like, so there are writers who finish writing, and the next day, they start writing again. Trollop? Roth does it as well. He did. He would finish a novel, and then the next morning, get up, start the next novel. When you see it like that, you're like, what, what is wrong with... That's weird. Like, who does that? It's like being... The servant of something that's bigger than you. Well, I also think that writing can be a tremendous place to hide. Yeah. A whole life. You can hold, hide your whole life. Yeah. It's, a, it's an alternative way of living. It's not living, really. It's a kind of slug life. You just sit and type. Um, so my narrator is a bit slug. She's not living, really. She's always living for yeah, other people. Right. Um, vicariously. And I think a novelist's life is a vicarious life in the end. Um, but I, I was also just curious, it's living in New York a little bit, how many of my students and young people I knew in, in a much bigger, less intimate, uh, kind of political, oh, well, socio-historical way, were submitting to an economy where they work for free for all these different people, or they are somebody's assistant, or so, and, and they were feeling some kind of fake frisson from the glamour of being the assistant of what X, Y, Z, and what they're actually being was like totally exploited in this extraordinary way. And I kind of wanted to write about that too. And then the more I thought about it, I thought about an economy that is always basically exploiting somebody else. And someone is always living in the shadow of someone else. And then it, it expands in your mind to country size, right? Where whole countries are being used as kind of client states, mm -hmm. servant states, making our clothes, sending our food and suffering themselves. So it just keeps on expanding in my mind. I know it's a slightly jaundiced vision, but sometimes you wake up, you look at the world, it looks like that. A series of completely exploitative relationships between the powerful and the weak. But it's a wonderful structure for the novel. And, and it right. really talks about things that I think that's are the important are so thing. That the corrupt world is a very useful that's structure right, for exactly. my That's right, exactly. You've made it work. That's, what, that's the important takeaway. <laughs> I want to talk about two more things, and then I want to let people ask some questions. I want to talk about movie musicals. Yeah. And I want to ask you about La La Land. <laughs> it's, it's... First of all, I love redhead so much. In all my novels, there's always a redhead, and they're always the hero, one way or another, heroic redhead. Second of all, I love musicals. I cannot really account for why I dislike La La Land so much. I look forward to it for months, and... I mean, from a practical point of view, they're lovely actors, and in a musical, you always have a choice between acting, singing, and dancing, right? And mm -hmm. historically, the movie musical makes a compromise, says, well, Bing Crosby can't really act, can't really dance, but whoa, he can sing. Or Gene Kelly, not a great actor, but can sing and dance. Or Fred Astaire, not bad actor, amazing dancer, fair singer. I feel like a movie musical which chooses two extraordinary actors who can neither sing nor dance. Wow. That's too much for me. Yeah. That's not a musical anymore. So... I was a bit lost, and also a bit, a bit annoyed that doing this is meant to convince me that you're tap dancing. <laughs> That's not tap dancing. So, I was very let down. I don't know, I went to see it, and then in the last two minutes, everybody's phones lighted up, it's because Debbie Reynolds had just died, and, and the contrast to me was too strong. I went to see Singing in the Rain in your honor on the big screen this past Sunday, oh. the 65th anniversary. Well, okay. I mean, there you go. Yeah. 
And it turns out, I found out in all the stuff about Debbie after she died, that she could not dance six months before that movie started shooting. She went into intensive training, and well, there's the result. And the, the, to be fair to Emma Stone, who is totally delightful, uh, I bet she had two months, and I bet she had 300 other things to do, and the studio system doesn't exist anymore. It used to have these actors as prisoners. You had to do what they said, That's and the movies were amazing. Gotta bring that back. Yeah, <laughs> and now they're all liberated, and look what you get, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Um, tell me about what you're reading, because that's what we were talking about in the hall, and you should all hear um, this. Well, I, I read this extraordinary book. Yeah, let's book. skip over no, that. No, but it is extraordinary, but no. I'm sure you've all already read it. That was my first autumn book. Uh, I read Colson, I read Dave Eggers, I read an amazing book that you all haven't got yet, but booksellers are reading, and called Exit West by Mohsin Hamid, who's a Pakistani-British perhaps a little American too, right? He lived here for many years. That to me is an extraordinary book. Um, I've just been reading so much fiction. I read uh, Yagai Asi, Homegoing, which I thought was one of the greatest books perhaps ever written by a person of that age, 22 when she started. Um, it's extraordinary. So uh, to me, like I, I wasn't reading when I was writing Swing Time that last year. So I woke up from the dream of a novel into this really pretty f competitive fictional sphere. I was like, whoa, everybody's game is like lifted considerably. It, it's, it's been really amazing. intense. You know, there really are years, and I know this a lot more now that I co-own a bookstore, there really are kind of dud years. Right. right. Um, and this, this, was not year, a dud year. this year was unbelievable. It was really something. And uh, like we're talking about young women writers like Alexandra Kleeman or Tessa Moshfeg. Like there was a lot this year of people either brand new out the gate or like Colson writing their best book. It, it's, it's been exciting. So, and some of it, like I talked to a lot of friends who'd read Exit West, other writers. That book feels like a prophetic book about what's happening right now. So something, it must be to do with the times as well, that writers find themselves plugged into a historical moment and they really uh, hit it out the park. And that's so. coming out in March? I'm looking at Karen I think it's March. Kat. March? Coming soon, I hope. Yeah. It's tiny. I mean, you'll read it in a day and it'll blow your mind. It's so great. Um, and There's a little book in May called Chemistry, a first novel. I just was hearing about that. Yeah, which yeah. I loved. By someone who was a chemist, right? Yeah. Originally. Yeah. No, it, it's, a, it's a good time. And for me personally, like, uh, the past five years, say, this kind of African diasporic novel that's been everywhere. People like Teju and Chimamanda. And, like, that was a kind of fulfillment of something I had hope to see when I was a kid, you know. So that, that was really, that's been really something for me. Um, yeah, it's a good time for books. Is there ever a kind of novel that you think, oh, I really wanted to write that kind of novel. Look, they did it. Okay. No, but I have I'm that feeling every single time. <laughs> I read a good book. I, I am going to speak about your book for a minute and I, you can't stop me. The thing which I thought, which was so, which made me want to write like that, is what I said to my husband, is that for so long through that book, I didn't know what it was about. Do you know what I mean by that? Mm -hmm. In a strict sense of being thematically whacked over the head a hundred times, which is what a lot of novels do. And certainly, when I was younger, I used to do it a lot too, or I thought that's how novels were made. The magic of that novel is it's like life. Like you have to, it's like a going through. You have to process the whole thing. I think I know what it's about now. I don't, I don't know if you would agree, but I think I know. But it was that uh, gentleness. Like you'd need so much confidence as a writer not to say every page, oh, by the way, this novel is about X. You can tell from the metaphor Y <laughs> and the allegories. Yeah, like, th that's how people write a lot of the time. And it's been a long time since I've been in the presence of such maturity, you know, that kind of confidence that the story is, its, is itself and, uh, and the reader will have that process, that going through. Thank you. It's because That's, I'm past middle age. I, well, that, I read it aspirationally thinking, I'm going to get there one day. I'm not going to write your, these essayistic when novels. When you're my age. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I want to be. I thought it was so beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what, a, what a wonderful note on which to open this up and get a few questions in. So be a pal. Ask a question. Don't, don't stand up and talk endlessly. Yes. No, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, uh, so the, qu the question is, is about um, uh, the evil of banality. Like, if, if we are um, 
doomed to go further along the path that we seem to be heading down, if I understand you correctly. Uh, I've said also in that essay, and I do believe it, that people are plural. They have a lot of possibilities within them. I think in the middle of a, an unprecedented economic depression, which is what we're in, even though, in my opinion, and in fact, factually, thanks to the present president, it wasn't quite as horrific as it could have been. But in moments like this, there is a, a necessary uh, contraction. People become scared. And it, it um, is reflected in lots of aspects of their lives. They become more inward thinking. They become more tribal. And I, I don't, uh, I, of course I condemn it, but I don't really see the point of sitting around on armchairs condemning it. I think uh, comprehending it is more important. And trying to speak to people in their plurality, trying to find that part of them that can hear you. I really, when I went to have that lunch with the bar, I wasn't feeling particularly chipper about the situation or any of the other writers. We were awed by his continued optimism, awed by it, you know, by his ability to continue feeling it. Um, I, I know some people think it naivety in his, on his part, but I, I think in his case it is hard earned. And he had that experience very early on uh, when he was uh, stumping, walking around the country, talking to people, of you know, walking into small white, small, small holdings in Ohio farms, meeting a family who didn't want anything to do with him, and talking them around. He, he knows that that's possible. Part of it is rhetoric, part of it is finding some connection with people where they can understand you, can understand them. But I think that is possible. I continue to hope for it. And I think that it becomes easier, as I tried to say in that piece, like my father was a, a, an old white guy, like, like the kind of person who's being vilified at the moment. But he was an old white guy in a moment of uh, economic buoyancy in England, of state protection, of universal health care, of free education. These things help a lot with your grumpy old white man attitude in the morning. They help. It made a different man of him living in that kind of state. He could have been a very different person, I think, in a different kind of state that didn't protect him and didn't protect his family and show him possibilities, ways to thrive, you know? So it doesn't entirely surprise me that people find themselves in extreme economic situations with no way to thrive and fall back on some very ancient atavistic feelings. Um, but I, I don't think they are solely to blame in those feelings. Um, I, it was, this is a question about a film that I was writing with my husband for um, this French auteur director called Claire Denis. Um, uh, I got chucked off that project. <laughs> uh, my husband stayed on and he wrote the movie and it, it, they're making it, I think. Um, the problem between me and Claire, she is an extraordinary director, but uh, she is French and I am English. And there is a, <laughs> a fundamental aesthetic difference between the French and the English, um, which we couldn't overcome, you know. She thinks in images um, exclusively, I think, in words. I, I am concerned with plot, she is not. Um, I admire her entirely, but we couldn't find a way uh, to work together because uh, anything I brought forward to her was banal. You know, she doesn't, she's not interested in people in the same way. So she's made really great movies, though, despite having zero interest in, in people. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have faith in it. I think, I think it will be good, but I, I was not the right person. Like, the, the things I can do, she doesn't need, you know. Even dialogue, she doesn't need, really. She's a visual person, and her films are made of, of image. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You? Um, you kind of touched on this earlier, uh, talking about writing a book that can be taken apart as autobiographical. So when you're writing, how do you notice maybe that you're writing too much of yourself on, your, on the page? Or like, how do you take yourself out of the story and make sure that you're writing from the perspective of your character or in the line of your story? As uh, I, I think I have the opposite problem. I think a lot of novelists do. I, I notice reading uh, this crop of autumn novels, a line that I kept on underlining. I don't think I found it in Commonwealth, but I found it in Saffron Foer's book. I found it in Shabon's. I think I found it in Eggers. I am no one, or some variation of that. I, I think that is a, the true state of novelists. <laughs> I think their, their own sense of identity is very uh, shaky, honestly. I think actors are a bit like that too. I think actors are a more extreme pathological case, in my opinion. <laughs> Writers are on slightly firmer ground. But 
But so I don't. I am aware from friends and my husband and that that I have. I I appear to others to have a strong personality. I I see that. But if you ask me what I was like, I wouldn't have a lot to say. I, I would have a lot to say about what you were like. I'd make a really good guess based on how you look and your voice and the way you look at me. And that that would be e easy fun. That's what I like to do. But if you ask me what I was like, it would be a shorter. List. I don't have a sense of having many personal qualities. I don't. I don't see myself that way. So I think that's why um, when I wrote in the first person, it ended up being an absence. You know, she's barely there. She doesn't really exist. That. That's a kind of. It was. It was a practical decision, plot-wise, but it was also uh, perhaps just a reflection of how I. I see myself most days. Um, I mean, being married to a writer, we're not very. I, I don't find us very writerly. Like we have all the same domestic arguments as everyone else, and I don't notice that they're about like Tolstoy. <laughs> <laughs> they're just—it's just the normal stuff. It's all the same boring stuff. Um, I mean, we we work together quite closely a lot of the time, um, and he just finished writing a novel. I was editing it. He did the same for me. But I don't. I, it doesn't seem to me like. Romantic or in, it seems very practical the work we do for each other. It's just like a practical thing, like give you a novel, I'll cut this out, the bad bits, and rearrange it. It, it, it never feels uh, in the way when people talk about creativity or art. I never feel that that's that seems like it should be more romantic or lofty day-to-day -day experience of it. To me, it seems more I don't know, just w work. We work for each other in various ways when we're writing. Um, but most couples just don't work together. I mean, that, that, I think, is the, the difference. I realize sometimes when I talk to other couples, like, it amazes me how little couples actually see each other if they have real jobs, right? Like, the, you do the school run if you have kids, and then everyone gets back in at 5.36, like, and then you see each other for that little bit, and then the weekends are like your first real exposure to each other, the whole weekend. And then, of course, holidays are the extreme version where you're like, Jesus, you, <laughs> I'm married to you. <laughs> I've spent two weeks with you. But I, I guess I don't have that experience. I, I do see Nick every moment of every day, pretty much. Uh, either sitting in the house working or in the library working. So th that is a difference, I think, this kind of constant uh, exposure to each other. Um, with the kids, I, I felt very strongly, again, from college, meeting the children of writers, sometimes famous writers. So I went to Cambridge and there were these fancy people there. And you go home, you know, visit them on the holidays, visit their families. And I saw a lot of um, children who had had really hard times with writer parents. It was the 70s and there was that attitude of, I mean, there's a little bit in your book, no, that description, you know, I'm a great man, I close the door and I write my great book and you're all meant to be happy for me because I just won the booker or whatever. A kid doesn't care if you won the booker, a kid doesn't care about any of that. So I, I saw a lot of stuff that scared me about being the child of a writer, like how, just the vanity of it and how much they, what they did to their families. Then I talked to women writers, so I met quite a few, again, mothers of friends of mine, like uh, uh, Jenny Diskey or uh, Lisa Pignanese, um, and they spoke about Doris Lessing, who they'd all known, and the women writers had a certain different attitude, like they would leave the door open with the idea, you know, come in, come out whenever you want. So I tried that, and in a lot of ways, that's worse. <laughs> the child wanders in, and you're like, hi, hi, uh, hi, yeah, hi, uh, yeah. So I, I just finally took some advice from Nick Hornby, actually. He said, just get out the house, like anybody else who has a job. Kids understand that. You have a job. Go and do your job. Get out of the house, go somewhere else, come back at the end of the day, just like a boring nine to five. That's much better. I think what's intolerable is, oh, mummy's in a house writing her book. You can't come in. I, that doesn't make any sense to a kid. They don't care. And you want to choose? There's a lot of, a lot of questions, and we're going to have to close it down soon. So think, who's got the really good question? You in the corner back there. Can you tell by looking at them? I don't know. With the arm way up, yes. Yeah. A bit louder. I didn't hear the beginning. How is your experience as a biracial Um, I think the thing I do have in common uh, with the character in the book, 
or at least there's a line somewhere in the middle which I wrote at the end of the whole process, like in copy edit, I added a line um, <laughs> that made me cry. I never cry when I write. And so when I wrote that, I thought, well, that's quite interesting. Why does the line there in the copy edit stage, it's a very late stage to add an important line mm -hmm. in the middle of a book. And the line was something about, um, about I, I think as a child, I was strange both to my mother and my father. And, and something about, um, I can't remember exactly now, but, but the, the, the point of my childhood, she says, was to demonstrate there was nothing strange going on here. We're perfectly fine, everything's perfectly fine, it's all perfectly fine. And I realized right now that that was true, that me and my brothers were kind of encouraged um, to be the best example of happy biracial children that could ever exist in the history of the world. Because people were always asking you, are you okay? It's the 70s, you know, are you all right? Are you confused? So my mother and father were very proud and they were like, no, we're not confused, everything's fine here. There's nothing going on here, nothing unusual. Um, so we all took that line very uh, seriously, I think. Um, so now I'm 41, and it did occur to me, well, maybe it was, there was something quite unusual going on. And also, I guess having my own children and having that experience of having children that don't look like you, which is, it's fine, and you get used to it, but it's not nothing. It is a strange experience. I expected my children to be brown, like me, and look like me with my hair, and they don't. And I'm sure my mother expected me to look like her, and I don't. And I'm sure my father expected me to look like him, and I don't like him either. So it's a series of like biological alienations, which, which are, you can get over them, and they're interesting, and they're not all negative, or, but they do exist. It is a, an unusual sensation, I think, because it, the biological expectation of sameness is probably very strong in a person. Um, so I, that's the, the only thing, I think, as I've got older, that I've recognized that how complicated it must have been for both my parents in different ways. How complicated to be mistaken for my mother for being my nanny or my babysitter or whatever. How complicated for my father to be thought of as my old elderly boyfriend or whatever people thought he was. Like, that must have been odd for, for both of them. Um, so that, that's it, a kind of retrospective recognition of the complexity of it. Um, it's just, it's a, questions about the difference between writing essays and fiction. It's just much less agonizing, it's not, mm -hmm. it's just an essay. Yeah, just, I always say it's like doing your grocery list. Yeah, it's like a nice piece of <laughs> homework and you do yeah. it and you did the homework well and someone says nice essay and then that's nice. <laughs> it's, it's, it's work, and, but it can be done cleanly and in a, yeah. and it can be done well. That's the other thing, it can be done in a kind of, formal way where everyone can agree, well, that was good, well done. A novel isn't like that. A novel is an embarrassment, always. <laughs> it's always excruciating both to write and to have read. It's always a mess. There's always something wrong with it. Somebody said that, right? And the definition of a novel is a long piece of writing with something wrong in it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it is. And, and for people who are perfectionists, aesthetes, Formalist, the novel will always be a horrible shame and a disappointment, and it should just get rid of, and it's just a terrible thing. But for those of us who like it, that about it, its messiness, its humanness, the fact that you can wade through 30 pages and then suddenly find something which is unbelievable, like a gem in your life, to me, that is the purpose of fiction. I, I love essays, I like writing them. It's nice to be smart or to be thought of as smart or impress somebody with your smartness, but that's not the same thing as novel writing. Novel writing is a huge risk. You look like a fool, and even if you do it well, at least 30% of people will hate it and think you're still a fool. Um, it's a completely different exercise, but I think the benefits of it are, are so much larger emotionally for everyone involved. And also writing an essay is sending up a little flare, saying, I am still alive. Right. I've been writing this novel oh, for yeah, years yeah. and I, years. I'm here. But I'm here. It's still oh, look, there's on. Sadie. She yeah. Does, that's nice. Yeah. And it's always, it's always a little vain or something. So yeah. it's connected to vanity, or it, it's an impure exercise, even though people who like essays think of them as such, as such pure gems. There's something not, it's different. It's like a, a saying, it's a statement of some kind. A novel is, a, is, you're not in control of all the elements, and that's kind of the thrilling part of it. That someone will read it and, and see something about you, or some things which are deeply unpleasant a lot of the time. It, it's, when I'm reading novels, I feel like I, I'm getting really close to a human. When I'm reading an essay, I think, something's being presented to me very nicely and well done and aren't you clever, but that's a different 
exercise? I think that's a good place to stop. Thank you. Thank um, you. Uh, let me just say um, the books are going to be for sale, Parnassus books. You remember us. <laughs> um, out in the front, and Zadie will sign. Please be kind. You know what I'm talking about. When you come up in the line, be nice to her. Also, I'm having dinner with Anne later, so um, yeah, let's do this. Yeah, don't tell her. Don't tell her every single thing about your life. Thank you. Um, you can thank tell you me something. So much. Thank you.